All right, so we're going to be talking about adrenal tumors. And so let's first start by briefly talking about the anatomy and physiology of the adrenals. So as you know, these are small glands that are located at the superior pole of each uh, kidneys, one on each side. And adrenals have two parts, the cortex and the medulla. They are distinct physiologically and in terms of their development as well. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. The cortex is made of three layers. We have a zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis from outside to inside. The way I remember these layers is GFR. Um, as, as you know, this is a acronym for glomerular filtration rate. So that's how I associate it. From outside to inside, the layers being GFR, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. Okay, so embryologically, the cortex of the adrenals develops from the uh, mesoderm, and the medulla is of neuroendocrine in origin. Anatomically, adrenals are inverted V or Y shaped glands. They are about three centimeter by five to seven millimeters in size. They get their arterial supply from three sources, adrenal artery, which arises directly from the aorta, a branch of the phrenic artery that comes down and travels inferiorly from the phrenic artery and a branch from the renal artery, which arises and, and runs superiorly from the renal artery. So adrenals have three different arterial supplies the venous drainage is slightly different left versus right. So the right adrenal drains directly into the IVC and the left adrenal can drain into the left renal vein or directly into the IVC. So the three layers of the cortex, glomerulosa secretes aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. Fasciculata secretes cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid. And the reticularis secretes androgens. Medulla being neuroendocrine in origin, has chromaffin cells that secrete catecholamines such as adrenaline and noradrenaline. In terms of the pathophysiology of adrenals, since it's an endocrine organ, we can have either hyperfunction or hypofunctioning of the uh, adrenal. So hyperfunction of the adrenal involves either Cushing syndrome, Kahn's syndrome, or adrenogenital syndrome. So Cushing syndrome is when glucocorticoids are secreted and the gland becomes independent of ACTH control from the pituitary, and this could be when there is an adrenal adenoma or a carcinoma. Kahn syndrome is also called primary hyperaldosteronism, so the mineral corticoids are excessively secreted, usually from a carcinoma or secondary to hyperplasia. Adrenogenital syndrome is where androgens are, are excessively secreted, and it leads to viralization. Hypofunction of the adrenals includes Addison's disease, and that could be autoimmune, secondary to bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, infections such as tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, or histoplasmosis. What you want to know about bilateral adrenal hemorrhage is that the most common cause is trauma, and it can also happen secondary to septicemia when it's called waterhouse Friderichsen syndrome, and it can also happen because of a hemorrhagic tumor that arises from the adrenal. The X-linked leukodystrophy is the most common genetic cause of adrenal insufficiency, and congenital adrenal hyperplasia is due to 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So these are two uh, sort of important information from the exam point of view. So this slide shows a transaxial CT image with IV contrast and a coronal image at the level of the adrenals. And you can see here, this is the normal right adrenal. Here is a normal left adrenal. Similarly, on the coronal image, this is a normal right adrenal. This is a normal left adrenal. So adrenal tumors are very common. They could be either benign or malignant. Tumors which are larger than four centimeter in size, irregular and heterogeneous in appearance, and increase in size with time. And we see invasion of surrounding structures or metastatic disease are more likely to be malignant 
compared to benign lesions. Tumors can arise from the cortex versus the medulla of the adrenal. They could be either functional or non-functional. That means they could be secreting the hormone depending on the layer from which they are starting or they could be non-functional and not secreting the hormone. The functional tumors, since they're uh, secreting hormones, they make the patient symptomatic from those secretions and they're detected early when the tumor is small. Compared to non-functional tumors, they can become very large in size and they're detected only when they're causing any mass effect on the surrounding organs. Frequently, adrenal tumors are incidentalomas. We are doing CT of the abdomen and pelvis for some reason and incidentally find adrenal nodules or they could be metastatic disease when the patient has been diagnosed with a cancer and there are metastases to the adrenals. We want to differentiate between leave alone lesions, which are benign and they can be just followed up on imaging and nothing needs to be done about it, or the lesions which are surgical lesions and they need to be surgically resected. Typically lesions more than four centimeters in size uh, are removed by the surgeons. We use multiple imaging modalities CT is most commonly used. CT adrenal protocol includes an unenhanced CT, portal venous phase, and a 15-minute delayed sequence. For MRI, we do our typical T1 and T2 weighted images, T1 fat-saturated fat images, T1 fat-saturated images with contrast. We acquire in and out of phase images, and we also acquire DWI and ADC maps. We have several options in nuclear medicine to image the adrenals, F18, FDG, I-123 MIBG, Indium-111 octreotide, and more recently we have Gallium-68 dodatate. So these two, Indium-111 octreotide and Gallium-68 dodatate, they are specifically for neuroendocrine tumors. And so you can imagine that the adrenal medullary tumors would be imaged using these uh, agents. Sometimes we find adrenal tumors on ultrasound as well. Uh, specifically fat-containing tumors because we know that fat is hyperechoic on ultrasound. So ultrasound is um, is good in, in that for those particular pathologies of adrenals where there is uh, um, fat and we are seeing them as hyperechoic focus on ultrasound. Okay, so there are multiple different kinds of benign tumors that can arise from the adrenals. We can have adenomas, hyperplasia, myelolipoma, cysts, hemorrhage, collision tumor, pheochromocytoma, hemangioma, lymphangioma, or pseudomasses, which look like adrenal tumors, but they are something else. Let's start with adrenal adenomas. So adenomas are most common adrenal tumor, and incidentalomas are most commonly adrenal adenomas. They are benign. They arise from the cortex. They could be either functioning or non-functioning. They're typically one to five centimeters in size, homogeneous, well-defined. 70% are lipid rich and 30% are lipid poor. When we image them with CT, when and the attenuation is less than 10 Hounsfield units on a non-contrast enhanced study, that has an 89% sensitivity and 100% specificity for diagnosing adenome. So remember, on a non-contrast enhanced CT, if the Hounsfield units is less than 10, we have 100% specificity in diagnosing an adrenal adenoma. On a adrenal protocol CT, when the absolute washout ratio is more than 60% or the relative washout ratio is more than 40%, that's when we call the lesions as adenomas. With the relative washout ratio, the specificity is 100%. The characteristics of adenomas on MR include signal drop on out-of-phase images. And this is telling us that there is fat inside these lesions, and so these must be adenomas. We can do this visually, or we can use subtraction imaging to look for signal drop on out-of-phase images. There are other things that can be done, such as chemical shift ratio or signal intensity indices. Some people do it, most don't. If you happen to be reading an FDG PET, for some other cancer and you see in a nodule in the adrenal, try to look for the uptake in the nodule. If the uptake in the nodule is more intense than the liver and it's focal, it's more likely to be metastatic disease. If it is less intense than the liver and sort of faint, then it's more likely to be an adenoma. 
So typically adenomas are not FDG avid. Okay, so here we have two examples. On the top we have CT images and you can see here that there is a nodule in the right adrenal and this nodule has a Hounsfield unit of minus 14 Hounsfield units or attenuation of minus 14 Hounsfield units. So that would make it an adenoma. And there is some contrast enhancement seen on the portal venous phase. On the bottom, we have an example from an MR showing in and out of phase images. And you can see that there is a signal drop between the two images, suggesting that what we are looking at is an adrenal adenoma. Here is another example using adrenal protocol on CT. So non-contrast enhanced portal venous phase and 15 minute delayed image. So the attenuation is 50 Hounsfield units, 110 Hounsfield units, and 60 Hounsfield units respectively. So we can calculate absolute was washout ratio using the formula, which is 80%, and relative washout ratio, which comes out to be 45%, so this is a lipid poor adenoma. It's lipid poor because on the non-contrast enhanced study, the attenuation is not less than 10 Hounsfield units. It is 50 Hounsfield units. If the attenuation is less than 10 Hounsfield units on the non-contrast enhanced study, we want to just stop there and not give this patient contrast and acquire additional images because we have already made the diagnosis of a lipid rich adenoma. When the attenuation is more than 10 Hounsfield units on non-contrast enhanced study. We want to acquire portal venous phase and 15 minute delayed image, calculate the attenuation, and then calculate the absolute and relative washout ratio to make a diagnosis of lipid poor adenoma, such as in this patient. Okay, here's an example from FDG PET. So this patient had a a whole body scan from base of skull to mid thighs using F18 FDG to evaluate this lung nodule. The lung nodule in the left lung base somewhere here does not show focal hypermetabolism. Incidentally, we found this mass in the left adrenal which shows faint uptake, most likely an adenoma. Here we have two different examples of adrenal hyperplasia. Adrenal hyperplasia can be either nodular, as you can see here in the right adrenal gland. There are multiple small nodules in the right adrenal. Similarly, there are multiple small nodules in the left adrenal. Or adrenal hyperplasia can be diffuse. That we see here, the diffuse enlargement of the right adrenal and diffuse enlargement of the left adrenal. So adrenal hyperplasia, remember, is typically bilateral and it can be either diffuse or nodular. Myelolipoma is an uncommon benign tumor that arises from the adrenal. It's non-functional and it could be incidental. It consists of fatty tissue and marrow-like or bone marrow-like hematopoietic tissue and it can undergo hemorrhage. So on ultrasound, because it contains fat, it appears hyperechoic. And since it's non-functional, it can enlarge in size and have mass effect on the surrounding organs. On the CT, it's characterized by presence of macroscopic fat where the attenuation is less than minus 30 Hounsfield units. The marrow elements can enhance if it's a contrast enhanced CT. On MR, we find T1 and T2 hyperintensity and loss of signal on fat suppression. So since it's macroscopic fat, we are not looking at in and out of phase images, but instead we are looking at fat suppressed images and loss of signal on those images. It's typically resected if it is growing in size or if it increases in size in, uh, or if its size is more than six centimeters. These are two examples of myelolipoma. The images on the top are showing a left adrenal tumor with internal fat component on a non-contrast enhanced CT and on the portal venous phase, you can see that the marrow elements, the soft tissue density shows enhancement, but the fat component, the macroscopic fat does not show any internal enhancement. And this looks just like the subcutaneous fat seen here on the non-contrast enhanced and compared it to the subcutaneous fat or the surrounding intra-abdominal fat. So this is macroscopic fat in a left adrenal myelolipoma. 
Now the patient, the images below at the bottom show bilateral adrenal myelolipomas and you can see the more impressive fat attenuation inside this left adrenal tumor which looks exactly the same as intra-abdominal fat and we see the same thing here on the coronal image on both sides so bilateral myelolipomas. Adrenal cysts can be either simple cysts that can have that usually has endothelial lining could be a pseudocyst from prior infection or hemorrhage. Rarely parasitic cyst can also be seen in adrenal, for example, echinococcal uh, infection. Lymphangiomas are also cystic lesions of the adrenal. They're typically thin walled and they show peripheral calcifications. On CT, adrenal cysts are well defined. They have water attenuation, they have thin wall, they do not show any internal enhancement and the walls or can be calcified or we may see mural calcifications. On MRI, the findings are same as any other cyst. We will have low T1 signal, high T2 signal, and T2 shine through, which means increased signal on DWI and increased signal on ADC. All right, so here we have two examples of adrenal cysts. On the top, we have a simple cyst. It's a large cyst arising from the right adrenal, seen here on the transaxial and on the coronal image. Thin wall, no internal soft tissue component, no septations. Wall is barely perceptible and it does not show any enhancement. At the bottom, we have a cyst arising from the left adrenal, which shows internal fluid attenuation, but thick calcified wall. Something like this is most likely a post-traumatic cyst. So after trauma, they develop adrenal hemorrhage and over a period of time, the hemorrhage resolves. There is uh, now fluid inside and there is mural calcification. Okay, so adrenal hemorrhage is generally secondary to blunt trauma or in a pediatric patient, you want to consider non-accidental injury. Other causes can include a coagulopathy, neoplasm or tumors that can bleed internally, such as myelolipoma that we talked about. Stress can lead to adrenal hemorrhage and also venous thrombosis can lead to adrenal hemorrhage. Right adrenal hemorrhage is more common than the left. On ultrasound, as with hemorrhage in any other organ, you would find a heterogeneous mass with absent flow. And over a period of time, it will decrease in size as the hematoma resolves. On CT, initially, it's going to be hyperattenuating and non-enhancing, and over a period of time, it will decrease in size and it will decrease in attenuation. On MR, the imaging appearance depends on the age of the hematoma. Typically, hematomas are T1 hyperintense and T2 hypointense, and they show blooming on GRE sequences. Here are a couple of examples. So on the top left, we have an ultrasound image showing a hematoma. This is the part which is showing some flow inside, but look at this part right here. And uh, we see heterogeneous echogenicity, and this is becoming smaller in size and becoming more organized with time. At the bottom, we have MRI showing T1 hyperintensity and some T2 peripheral hyperintensity in a right adrenal hematoma. Okay, so an interesting tumor that happens in adrenal, we call it a collision tumor. So collision tumor is when there are two pathologies seen inside an adrenal mass. All right, so here is an example of that. So right adrenal shows a mass which has fat foci. And so this was from an adenoma and the rest of it, the soft tissue component was metastatic disease from lung cancer. So typically it's a benign pathology that was already present and now we have metastatic disease also to the adrenal, so it looks like a large mass, but with two different components. One is a benign component, which is more commonly an adenoma, and a malignant component, which could be metastatic disease from uh, a primary such as lung cancer. So that's called a collision tumor. Okay, so what are the malignant adrenal tumors? We can have metastatic disease, lymphoma, pheochromocytoma, adrenocortical carcinoma, and tumors that arise from adrenal medulla 
these could be either ganglioneuromas, ganglioneuroblastomas, or neuroblastomas. So we'll start with adrenal metastasis. So adrenals, as you know, is one of the most common sites for metastatic disease after lung, liver, and bone. So the primary tumors that like to go to the adrenals include lung cancer, breast cancer, gastrointestinal tract primaries, prostate cancer, renal cell carcinomas, HCCs, and melanoma. Remember that isolated adrenal metastases are very rare. So when there is metastatic disease to the adrenals, you will find 99% of the times metastatic disease elsewhere also, such as in the lung, liver, or the bone. It's unlikely that adrenal is the only site of metastatic disease on that patient. All right. So on CT, they do not meet the criteria for adenomas, the absolute and the relative washout ratio that we talked about. With RCC and HCC, you want to remember that metastatic disease can contain fat and may show arterial enhancement. With MRI, there is no signal loss on fat-saturated images that we see with uh, myelolipomas. There is no signal loss on out-of-phase images that we see with adenomas. Metastatic lesions are T2 hyperintense. They enhance and they show restricted diffusion. So high signal on DWI, low signal on ADC. With FDG PET, we want to see focal hypermetabolism, uptake more intense in the liver, and the situations in which we have false negative findings, meaning that this patient has metastatic disease, but it does not show focal hypermetabolism is when there is hemorrhage, necrosis, small size of metastatic disease, and if the primary is a bronchoalveolar lung cancer or a carcinoid tumor, because these two pathologies are not FDG avid to begin with. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Here is a CT scan showing a tumor arising from the right adrenal with some central necrosis, peripheral enhancement. And look at the corresponding FDG PET, there is peripheral hypermetabolism. This was a patient with lung cancer, and this tumor in the right adrenal is metastatic disease from the patient's lung cancer. Here is another example. This patient um, had metastatic disease to the adrenals from colon cancer, and so on the whole body coronal image, we find large hypermetabolic masses in the right adrenal and also in the left adrenal. We also see hypermetabolic metastatic disease in the right lung, also in the left lung. And on the CT, we find the right and the left adrenal metastasis. This is a non-contrast enhanced CT that was a part of the FDG PET CT. And after treatment, we find that the metastatic disease has calcified in the lungs and also the adrenal nodules have now become smaller and calcified. So remember, mucinous tumors that arise from cold, from the GI tract can calcify, and tumors in general can calcify after treatment. So that's what we are seeing here in lung metastases and in adrenal meds. So primary adrenal lymphomas are rare. Typically, involvement of adrenals with lymphoma is when patients have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and there are other sites of lymphomatous involvement and adrenal happens to be one of them. So we can see diffuse infiltration, we can see nodular enhancement or presence of multiple masses in the adrenals. There is most of the times associated retroperitoneal adenopathy and the masses after treatment of lymphoma, they calcify. So on, on CT and MR, we would find hypoenhancing masses in the adrenals which show restricted diffusion which is a characteristic of malignancy such as lymphoma. And on PET, these lesions, lymphomatous involvement of adrenals would be intensely FDG avid. So here's an example. This on the ultrasound, on the top left, we see the liver and the right kidney. In front of the right kidney, abutting the liver, we see this large mass. And this is on the right side. We see the same thing on the left side. Here is a kidney, and superior to the kidney, we see this hypoechoic mass. These masses were characterized on MR. You can see here large mass arising from the right adrenal. Here is a mass arising from the left adrenal, and they are showing high T2 signal and minimal enhancement. 
Okay, so next tumor we'll talk about is a pheochromocytoma. These are adrenal medullary tumors, and they are associated with syndromes such as multiple endocrine neoplasia, neurofibromatosis type 1, von Hippel-Lindau disease, Sturge-Weber syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis. So this is one tumor, pheochromocytoma, that is associated with a lot of syndromes. It also follows what we call a 10% rule where 10% of the times pheochromocytoma is bilateral, 10% of the times it's malignant, 10% of the times it's extra adrenal, 10% of the times it's seen in children, 10% of the times it's syndromic, and 10% of the times it's non-functional. So most of the times it's a functioning tumor. Most of the times we find it in adults. Most of the times it arises from the adrenals. Most of the times it's benign. And most of the times, or 90% of the times, it is affecting one uh, adrenal and not both adrenals. So it's characterized by elevated plasma catecholamines and urine metanephrine. So when patients present with symptoms that suggest a pheochromocytoma, uh, these tests are performed and when the ele levels are elevated, they are sent for imaging to make a diagnosis or to evaluate them for a pheochromocytoma. On CT, pheochromocytomas are heterogeneous. They're seen as enhancing solid masses with slow washout. Their absolute and relative washout ratio overlaps with an adenoma. Local invasion and metastatic disease suggests a malignant pheochromocytoma. On MR, they are very T2 hyperintense. It's also called a light bulb sign. They enhance with contrast. They may show internal necrosis and hemorrhage. The nuclear medicine tracers that can be used for these tumors include I-123 MIBG, indium-111 octreotide, F18 fluorodopamine, or F18 FDG. Okay, so here's a good example with multiple images. We'll start with the ultrasound on the bottom left. So this patient was found to have this tumor in between the liver and the kidney. And so they underwent an MR, which we see, well, a CT first, where we see a mass arising from the right adrenal with peripheral enhancement and central necrosis, followed by an MR, where we see high T2 signal, peripheral contrast enhancement, seen here on the coronal image as well, and we see focal hypermetabolism. So this tumor was dissected and they were found to have a pheochromocytoma. Here is an example of metastatic pheochromocytoma on two different nuclear medicine studies. So it's the same patient. They also had history of breast cancer. So when they presented with suspicious lesions, we weren't sure whether this was a recurrent and metastatic pheochromocytoma that was dissected years ago, or this is a metastatic breast cancer. So they were started initially with FDG PET, and you can see that there are multiple lesions in the region of the liver, and there's a focus right here in the bone involving the left hemipelvis. And this was followed by a I-123 MIBG scan, which establishes that this is not metastatic breast cancer because breast cancer will not take up I-123 MIBG only pheochromocytoma will take up I-123 MIBG. And so all of these foci that we see here in the bones and the soft tissues, they are metastatic pheochromocytoma and not breast cancer because they take up I-123 MIBG. With FDG PET, they can both be hypermetabolic. Breast cancer can be hypermetabolic and um, pheochromocytomas are also hypermetabolic. But the distribution suggests on the FDG PET CT because it's recurrence in the region of the previously resected pheochromocytoma, so it's more likely to be a pheochromocytoma, but just looking at hypermetabolism, we cannot tell. But I-123 MIBG is very specific. All right, so next tumor we'll talk about is adrenocortical carcinoma. These are rare but aggressive tumors. They show a bimodal distribution. They're more common in the first and fourth or fifth decade of life. They're associated with leaf fraumeni syndrome, beckwith Weidemann syndrome, Carney complex, familial adenomatous polyposis, and MEN type 1. And so these can be functional as well. 
um, and that is in 50% of the times and when they happen in children where they are more likely to be functional. On CT, these are seen as large tumors and since they are aggressive, we can see much to the liver, lungs or bones, they enhance and they show venous invasion and also uh, local invasion. On MR, they are heterogeneous on T1 and T2 weighted uh, sequences. They show contrast enhancement and central necrosis or hemorrhage may also be seen. On FDG, on PET scanning, they are FDG avid, but they're not biopsied because we know that biopsy may lead to uh, tumor seeding of the biopsy tract. Here is an example of adrenocortical carcinoma where we see a large heterogeneous enhancing mass arising from the right adrenal on the transaxial image and we see the same thing on the coronal image. So this was resected and it was a adrenocortical carcinoma. At the time of the presentation, they did not have any metastatic disease. A rare tumor, we usually see these tumors in liver and this is a hemangioma. So we have a portal venous phase image showing a large tumor with peripheral discontinuous enhancement arising from the left adrenal. And then on the more delayed image, we find centripetal fill in of the contrast from outside to inside on this hemangioma. Another rare tumor is a primary adrenal angiosarcoma. On this patient, on the coronal CT, we see this large mass with mass effect arising from the right adrenal. Sometimes when the masses are large, it's hard to say where they are coming from. And only after resection, we know that, okay, this was adrenal in origin. So this tumor shows peripheral enhancement and the MR images show central necrosis, some peripheral enhancement that increases with time from here to here. There is more uh, enhancement on this delayed image. This is a T1 image with fat sat and contrast. And so this patient was diagnosed with an adrenal angiosarcoma. Other tumors that arise from adrenal medulla are in a spectrum. They are ganglioneuromas, ganglioneuroblastomas, and neuroblastomas. And they're often grouped together because they um, arise from the same tissue, which is adrenal medulla. And they are in a spectrum from benign to more malignant. So ganglioneuromas are benign, but neuroblastomas are malignant. All right, so neuroblastomas are most common extracranial malignancy of childhood. They secrete noradrenaline or VIP, which is vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. On CT, they are seen as heterogeneous abdominal masses. The characteristics of neuroblastomas include encasement of blood vessels. They lift the aorta from the spine. They cross the midline from one side to the other. They can extend into the spinal canal they can calcify and they may cause necrosis and hemorrhage. And these um, imaging findings are important because these help us differentiate neuroblastomas from Wilms tumor in a pediatric patient. They also show increased uptake with I-123 MIBG, which has the highest specificity. They're also FDG avid and take up I-131 MIBG or well, they take up I-123 MIBG, but they can be treated with a high dose of I-131 MIBG, which is a beta emitter. MRI, uh, you should know, has highest sensitivity. So I-123 MIBG has the highest specificity, but MRI has the highest sensitivity. MRI is preferred because it uses no radiation. We see increased T2 signal, and the intraspinal extension is very well visualized on MR versus nuclear medicine imaging. Here's an example in a pediatric patient of neuroblastoma on the transaxial image. You can see that there's a large tumor which encases the vessel that we see here in the sagittal image, lifts the aorta off the spine, crosses the midline. We don't see any calcification or hemorrhage in this tumor. After treatment, you can see that it has decreased in size significantly on the transaxial image and here on the coronal image or the sagittal image.
Okay, so next we'll talk about pseudomasses. So these are things that may look like adrenal tumors, but they are not adrenal tumors. So what else can look like an adrenal tumor? So look at this. This here looks like an enhancing mass arising from the left adrenal, but is in fact a gastric diverticulum. More inferiorly, we saw the normal left adrenal. Another patient here it looks like nodular appearance of the left adrenal, but it turns out these are collateral vessels in a cirrhotic patient. All right, so um, if you want more information, go to this paper. This is a good review uh, that we published uh, not too long ago, and you will find all the figures that I showed you with their legends uh, in this paper and more information on individual tumors. Thank you for your attention, guys. Are there any questions?